Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Amen. It's so good to see you today. You sound great. Uh, I don't know if our new schedule, we all wake up in our connect groups, you know, finally getting there. But you all sound great today. Stephen often talks about the greater choir and you, uh, you're singing well. You can tell the health of a church by the way the church sings. We are the singing religion. And by the way, the way men sing. How about that? The way the men sing uh, guides and leads uh, the rest of us in worship. What a sweet time. I mentioned last week, many of you like me, your first exposure to the world of finance was through a popular board game called Monopoly. Anybody play Monopoly? Um, and this is kind of a generational thing, but it's still popular. But if you're uh, you're my age or a little bit older, um, you probably have played the game. And I noted last week that every time the game is played, after all the properties are purchased and, and houses are built and hotels are built and you're your rivals are decimated and you monopolize the board. When the game is all said and done, it all goes back in the box. Every game ends that way. And you have nothing real, nothing tangible to show for it. Other than maybe a prideful boast about how you beat everyone else until you play again. And Jesus reminds us that it's possible to live real life that way. Not, not a game, but real life. It's possible for us to go through life just seeking to monopolize, seeking to be one up on others, seeking to be successful, and at the end of life to perhaps have nothing to show for it. It all goes back in the box. Last week after our services, I headed home and I discovered like you did somewhere along the way early afternoon for me what took place at First Baptist Church Sutherland Springs when a man came into a worship service a small church and essentially everyone in worship was either killed or wounded we began to pray for the pastor and for that church the pastor lost his 14 year old daughter and I saw that those funerals are now beginning so many funerals taking place and uh, I guess it just kind of hit close to home for me as a pastor as a father of a daughter daughters and it just weighed heavy on my heart for a couple of days and then Monday morning I literally well no Sunday afternoon Stacy and I, I got a call that, that someone, uh, a dear friend of ours, we were told might be dying. So we rushed up to Medical City to see her. And, and then on Monday morning, uh, I literally watched a man die right in front of me. And then Tuesday, we had a funeral here. I had one of those weeks that happens for a pastor often where I'm just, I was just faced with death one, one day after another. And I realized that in my role as a pastor, uh, I probably experienced that more than most. And I count it a real blessing because every day that I have a day like that, all through my ministry, I'd go home and I would, I'd realize, wow, this life is short. I mean, Monday morning, I thought, as I watched this man die, right in front of me, I thought, that's me. I left that room, and I was, I was like, that's me. Someday. And that's you. And I see it as a blessing in disguise. I would go home through the years. I'd head home and hug my wife a little bit tighter, hug my kids a little bit longer. Because there's coming a day, it just made, makes me realize, in an instant, Everything changes. And I see life for what it really is and what it's all about. In a moment, everything becomes clear. And there are so many times when Jesus wants us to see it while we're here, breathing, alive. And he wants us to make some decisions that are going to change that moment and change eternity. 
And so that's what he's going to talk to us today about in, in Mark chapter 8. If you'll go ahead and turn there, Mark 8, verse 34 through 37. If you've been in church much, you will know this is a profound teaching by Jesus. And what I want us to do is turn to this passage, and we're going to talk about what it is to truly maximize our lives. I don't want to waste my life, and I know you don't either. That's why you're here today. But how do you know? How do you know if your life really is successful? How do you know if you're really getting ahead, living on purpose? Because what happens is we get off track when we don't remember what the scorecard is, or we don't know what the scorecard really is. And when we don't know the scorecard, our default mode is comparison. And so we measure ourselves up against other, a, others. Am I more successful than the other? And if I am, then that leads to pride and arrogance. If I'm not, it leads to envy. We've said that comparison is the thief of joy. But what if it's not about comparing ourselves with others? What if we could really understand what true profit is? Today I want to look at what it is to chase after false profit. And Jesus is going to teach us here in Mark chapter 8, beginning with verse uh, 34. Look along with me. And calling the crowd to him, so he'd been teaching his disciples. This is interesting. He draws the entire crowd now to him with his disciples. And he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? Now, when I was a kid, my first money-making venture was a lawn mowing business. Now, I use the word business lightly because I had only a few yards, and ours was one of them. Uh, there, was, there was no overhead. I mean, I was really young. Um, my parents, I think, were teaching me, you know, just how to work hard and then how to make money and what to do with money and even how to save money a little bit. But there was, there was no owner, I mean, no overhead for me. There was no risk involved. Uh, if you know, if the lawnmower broke down, the money maker broke down, my dad would get it fixed. I couldn't get it fixed. If we ran out of gas, I couldn't go get gas. He'd get gas. And so all of this was provided for me. I just made money. Not a lot, but I simply made money, and then I could spend it any way I wanted to, really. There was no risk. There was no real savings. And so there was no real value, no real profit in what I did. Uh, here we have a passage where Jesus talks to us about real risk and real savings and real profit. And that's how I want us to break this passage down. He enters into the world of finance and he says the real profit comes through real risk. It comes through real savings and it comes through, through recognizing real value. And my prayer is that the Spirit will speak to each of our hearts this is a tough passage. I'm going to tell you ahead of time. So I'm asking the Spirit to do what I cannot do, that you would open your heart and say, Lord, show me how I can give my life to the things that really matter. So let's talk about uh, the solution to being owned by a false prophet, kind of a play on words, but we're often seeking after what really is no profit at all. The first thing Jesus says, three points today, real simple, if you're taking notes here, real profit comes through real risk. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. He is certainly talking about uh, salvation, but even more, he's talking about what it is to live the Christian life. That's important to note. He's going to say to be a disciple. If you're going to come after me, you're going to live a life of self-sacrifice. So uh, I'll keep getting us back to that because he's talking about what it is to, what does this life look like that really is true profit? So one of the ways you can Make a profit is by taking risks, right? You've heard, you've heard it said you, you got to spend money to make money. Uh, in the world of investing, you have high risk that could equal high reward. Not many people want to go that route because it also has high loss, high, high risk of loss uh, as well. Now, having a savings account is a good thing. 
doesn't gain a lot, of, a lot of interest. There's not a lot of risk, right? And so the more the risk, the greater the reward. And Jesus calls us to real profit, and he says it only comes through real risk, okay? Now hang with me here. Real risk is following him. Real risk is giving your life up to him by faith and then living in a way that is risky. When you live a life of self-sacrifice, it shows up in two ways. Here's what he says. First, real risk comes when we recognize we're doing what Jesus himself has already done. So he's not calling us to something he is not willing or ready to do and now on this side of the cross has done. Look at verse Uh, Go back to verse 29. I want you to see this conversation he's having with his disciples in verse 29. And he asked them, uh, who do you say I am? Perhaps you remember that famous question. And Peter's the one, impetuous Peter, but this time he jumps out there and he gets it right. You're the Christ. That word is Messiah, liberating king. That's who you are. And here he's strictly charged them, hey, don't tell anyone this, not yet. You're right. You got it. Way to go, Peter. Verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. He said it explicitly. What Jesus is doing here is, Peter, I know what you think you mean by Messiah. Let me tell you what the truth is. Here's what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be killed by the establishment. Think about that. By religious leaders, morally justified politicians, the best of what the world has to offer. That's who's going to kill me. Not the worst, not the drunkards, the thieves, not the liars, but the best that the world has to offer. They're going to take me and they're going to kill me. After three days, I'm going to rise again. Now, Peter says this is not how it's going to go down. He has trouble with this, and who wouldn't, right? This is not what he anticipated. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine that. Let's rebuke Christ Jesus, the Son of God. And he calls his opposition, Jesus does, calls Peter's opposition satanic. He says, Satan is speaking through you. Because these things must happen. And then this is where he, he gathers the crowd in, and then he offers the teaching that we've just seen. Jesus says that real risk is going to come by doing what he's already done. So watch this. This is not simply a salvific message. He is saying, I'm going to die on the cross, yes, for your salvation. But as you receive Christ, you're owned by him. And then your life looks like his life. And and he says next, he says, real risk comes when we decide to follow him. So we take up our cross and we follow him. And this is for everyone. This is interesting. He calls everyone in, not just believers, not his disciples, but everyone. And he wants everyone to know the risk that there is in following him. But he also wants them to know the reward. Now, some of us think, that we've been involved in some pretty high-risk ventures. Maybe we pat ourselves on the back, some of us. I, I, I went for it, and I won big. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Real risk, true risk is when you give up your life for the sake of others. True courage, true daring is to live a life for his sake and for the sake of the gospel and for the joy of others. This is what he's saying. This is real risk when you give your life. And then he tells us it comes in two ways, okay? Now, now keep tracking with me here. Real risk comes in two ways. You must first deny yourself. You see that? It's verse 34. Give your life to him. Here's what he's saying. Make your life uncomfortable. Now, this is the hard part of the message. Again, it's one thing to give our lives to him and say, good, he's got my eternal life. I've given my life to him. I'm going to heaven. And like Hudson and Seth, perhaps I've been baptized, I've proclaimed that Christ belongs, that I belong to him, I'm owned by him. But now Jesus is teaching us, not simply, yes, give your life to him by faith to be saved. He's saying, now, here's what this life looks like. 
Turn aside from your own affections and desires what's best for you and yours. Enter into a life of self-denial. And this self-denial, he's saying, is comprehensive. It runs across every area of your life to be owned by him. John Calvin noted it. He said it this way in a commentary on this passage. Give our consent to be reduced to nothing, to be owned by God, provided that God lives and reigns in us. First, you deny yourself. Secondly, then take up your own cross. I want you to think about your life. Jesus will literally do this for us, but what he's saying here is take up the very instrument of your own execution. The cross represents sacrifice, and, and, and this sacrifice is before God and for the sake of others. The cross is this. It, it is a portable execution device. Think about it this way, and I want, to ask, I want you to ask this question. Where is your cross? Where's your cross? Are you carrying your cross? So, so I'd, I'd put it in these terms as I've thought about it this week. Um, in your home, set up your cross, crucify yourself, now live in your home. Go to work, find yourself at work, set up your cross, Crucify yourself. Now work. Again, go home. Crucify yourself. Start husbanding, parenting, wifing. Give yourself away. You find yourself at school, young people, students. Go to school, set up your cross, die, and give your life away to others. And as believers, I think a great pattern is, how about this, wake up, set up your cross, and, and again, you're, you're praying, giving your life to the Lord, deny yourself, set up your cross, crucify yourself, now live your life. Because as you head into the world, into life, already having denied yourself, you're there to serve others. I was in a small group with a group of men uh, last week, and, and I told them this, a real simple way, we were not talking about this explicitly but I said a great way to serve others and to serve your wife is simply to go home and ask this question how can I help how can I help one of the guys said if I went home and did that my wife would ask me what happened to you <laughs> and I said well blame it on me tell them the preachers I'd go home and ask this how can I help that's a simple way of denying yourself and saying my time for me doesn't matter as much as what I might do for you. It's a real simple way to deny yourself. That's crucifying yourself. Let me ask you this. Where is the cross in your life right now? Where is the cross in your calendar? Where are you offering yourself for the sake of others, for the gospel? Where is your cross in your time? Where are you giving your time when you'd rather be doing something else? That's self-sacrifice. Maybe you're giving up watching, watching your favorite show, watching the game, giving up sleep. You're giving up something in order to bless others. Where is the cross in your time, in your calendar? I said it last week. Where's the cross in your giving? You see, if you're giving to the Lord in terms of time and resource, yes, money, giving of your money to the church and ministries of the church, if that doesn't change your lifestyle, it's not sacrificial giving. There's no cross in your finances. Where's the cross in your life? Another way to take up your cross is to not try to hide your weaknesses. See, the cross is giving up yourself, not being strong anymore. And so as believers, you see, we can use our weaknesses as a platform. We don't have to hide our weakness. And this is something we so often do in Christian circles. Instead, let people see your weakness Carry, let them see you carrying your weakness because then Christ is glorified. Paul understood this when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, I would rather boast of my weaknesses because when I do that, the power of Christ is seen in me. See, that is an upside-down kind of way of thinking. 
That's the way of Jesus. That's the way of the cross. That's how we deny ourselves. We boast in our weakness. We're honest about our weakness. So let me ask you, how are you getting ahead in life? Are you truly being successful? How do you measure it? Jesus would say that one of the ways is, uh, if you're going to experience real profit, is through real risk. And that's giving your life away. And then secondly, real profit comes through real savings. And we see this in verse 35. You see, let me put it in, 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 in worldly terms first so you'll understand what I'm saying here. It's not just acquiring wealth uh, that is the quest, but really building on the wealth that you already have, right? So as we receive Christ, instead of keeping up with the proverbial Joneses, what we do is we say, you know what? I have a new life in him. Now I'm going to build on this life that he's given me and I'm going to give myself away to others. You're saving this life that you were meant to live, a life of thriving, flourishing. When we give ourselves away, it's, a, it's the great paradox. But what we do instead, we develop a strong sense of self-preservation. This is what Jesus is getting to here. It's driven by two things, pain and fear, or I should say the avoidance of pain and fear. Now think about it. This is at the crux of this message. What Jesus is trying to tell us here and elsewhere he does directly here. He says to his disciples, listen, if you want to be a disciple, you're going to face pain. You're going to face discomfort. If you're looking to avoid pain, discipleship is not for you. This is what he's saying. And then he says, who wants this? Come, come after me. So instead, we, we pile up comfort and insulate ourselves from any sort of pain. We hide our dying in hospitals and homes and we bury our dead in cemeteries and we fight wars that are half a world away and these are luxuries that we can afford. We do the same with fear. We want to protect ourselves. We have security systems. We build walls and we have gated communities and we want to be safe. None of these things are wrong, per se, if you're thinking with me here. None of these things are wrong. The problem is when we consider these as markers of the good life. We talked about it last week a little bit. For some of us, our treasure, the thing we pursue, the highest value in life is comfort, security, and safety. And my point is we then baptize this world system into our own lives, and we struggle to give up our time, reveal our weaknesses, to show our ourselves humble before others, to take time to serve others, to look for those in need, to give sacrificially. These are not things the world values. And so we, we live a different kind of life. See, Mario becomes a, the perfect example for us today because our, our, our soldiers who we honor, whom we honor this weekend, uh, first responders, they're all trained to run into risk and danger, not away from it. And Christians should do the same. We should step into space, not, not, not seek out martyrdom, but in daily life to find ourselves in places where most people wouldn't go. It, it is to, to face danger, risk, even fear. It's as much a part of following Jesus as getting wet is a part of swimming. It's part of the deal. To follow after Jesus means that we're going to embrace this as a lifestyle. This is, what Jesus, this is what Paul embraced as a lifestyle. He references in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 where he goes through all that he's been through. He's being stoned and shipwrecked and beaten and almost died several times. And he, he says this is the life that I've been called to. It was normal for him. But he also embraces the reward. If we had time to go to Romans 8, you would see he embraces the reward of what comes. He recognizes the ROI. When you give your life to the Lord, you, you're, you're actually saving your life. You're thriving, you're flourishing, you're saving the life that you've been called to live. It's an amazing thing. Jesus is saying to us, you give away your life and you end up saving your life. We save the gospel for the next generation. It's a saving life that is seen. It's seen by everyone. It's, it's a saving relationship that we have with Christ. We save treasure in heaven. We save all that we're meant to save. You see, in the Christian economy, it's, it's uh, being willing 
to, to, to give our lives to the Lord and to his glory. So finally, as we close, it's not just real profit through real risk, not just real profit through real saving, a saving life lived out in self-sacrifice, but thirdly and finally, real profit comes through real value. I'm gonna explain it this way. There's a great book, it was made into a movie. It's called Moneyball. I don't know if you, you saw this, but it's the story of the Oakland A's baseball team. And they, uh, they put together a contending baseball team by using players that other people, other franchises had devalued. They looked at a specific stat because baseball is all about percentage and they looked at a stat called OBP. Anybody? It's the on-base percentage, right? So they looked for players. They didn't really care how many hits or how they hit or how many home runs they hit. They wanted to see and find the players that could get on base. So they, they stockpiled their roster with players who walked a lot and they had great success and here's why. They valued something, certain players, that others devalued. And as believers, we do the same thing. We see the world differently. We value those who the world may not value. We pursue things, we profit, we see profit and value in things that the world would say has no profit or value. We pursue those who are in need, those who are poor. We care for the weakest among us. While the world pursues all the things that Jesus would call the world, he rescues us from, can I say it? From the American dream. And instead of just the same old life, go to school, get a job, get married, uh, make money, retire, and die. He rescues us from that kind of life by saying, listen, If you die to the world, this would be all that Jesus would call the world. He would say, instead, give your life to me. You begin to invest in those things of the kingdom. You value things that others would devalue. And this is where we find real value. He would say, in the end, the greatest value of all are the souls of men and women, boys and girls. Notice he says that your soul is of greater value than the entire world. The world and all the systems in it. Our world is of eminent value, endless worth. It's the only place that we know of where life can exist, where humans who have souls exist. It becomes the place. It's, it's almost like a setting, and we are the diamond. We're the thing that is the most valuable. Our universe, our world is most valuable because it inhabits the souls of men and women. Jesus says your soul is the most important, most valuable thing in the world. So here's what we have as I close. We have here insider information on how we should invest. And if you want to get in on some insider information here, we have the ultimate insider, Christ himself, and he is telling us something we did not know. That the values that we see in this world have been flipped upside down. Your soul is the most important thing in the world. Not everything else in the world. And we have this, the greatest insider of all, telling us how to invest our lives. So valuable is your soul that Jesus gave his life to purchase you. He placed a price tag on you. And Peter would later get it. He would say in 1 Peter, Chapter 1, he he would say this, if you call on him as father and judge, then while you're here for a moment in time, he calls this time exile, knowing that you were ransomed, you were purchased, bought back from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, the stuff of this world, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Last week I referenced first. Corinthians 6, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You no longer own yourself. 
but you've been bought with a price. You're owned by God. Friends, if you've received Christ, we're owned by him. And this is the great exchange. It's his righteousness for our sin. It's his life in us by this power of the Spirit to live our lives given over to eternal things. It's what Jim Elliott said, the great martyr. He was 26 or so, 28 when he died as a missionary. He is no fool who will give what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. And this is what the Lord is calling us to. I'm asking you today. The Lord Jesus is asking you to make a risky investment. Risk your life for others around you. Step into the needs of people around you. And as I've thought about this, in terms of your salvation, friends, listen, it is a risk-free investment. Listen, faith is not built on probabilities. Faith is built on certainties. Faith is built on facts. The facts of God's Word and the facts of what Christ has already accomplished for you. You give your life to Him by faith and you decide that you're going to give your life to the single investment that matters the most. Give your life to Him and you will save it. Jesus paid it all. All to Him we owe. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this, this challenge. It is hard for us to want to live a life of self-sacrifice. So God, we pray that by your Spirit you would transform our hearts and take this challenging teaching and let it become our lives, Lord. We know that then we experience great joy because then we have purpose, true profit in this world. And Jesus, thank you for leading the way so that we can be saved. And thank you for showing us what it is to live a life of self-sacrifice. God, teach each of us as we move into the afternoon, into this week. Show us how we can die to ourselves, take up our cross, be crucified for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel. I pray for those who've never received you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they say yes to you, even now. Jesus, thank you for paying all for us that we might give all to you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.